And we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house. It's Friday. Can you believe it? It's like 9.30-ish, and it's pitch black and raining out. I mean, you would have no idea. I feel like it's 10 o'clock at night here. So we got a little rain and thunderstorm going. And uh, look forward to getting some questions answered and, and connecting with some peeps. So how's everyone doing today? I didn't give much notice on today's chat. So I'll kind of give you guys a few minutes to, to jump on board here, and we'll begin. So my coffee here, I got a, a ghee with mixed with a little bit of Madagascar vanilla, and then my coffee. So nice little little mix. Got a little hint of vanilla in there today, which is great. Gotta love that. Vanilla is my fave. Any questions, feel free and chime in. What do you guys want to talk about? What do y'all want to talk about? I was at Paleo FX last Friday, a week ago today. It was great. We did a talk. I did I did a talk on thyroid health. It was good. We talked about a lot of the kind of the underlying top four or five causes of why you may have a thyroid issue. And a lot of people don't know that one of the biggest causes of a thyroid problem is going to be autoimmune, where your immune system is actually attacking your thyroid gland. I'd say number two is adrenal and stress issues can easily cause thyroid problems. And it does that because the more stressed you are, your body is hardwired to take and convert your thyroid hormone into inactive thyroid hormone called reverse T3. And that helps kind of hit the receptor site, but it doesn't have that same metabolic activity. So it's like putting a metabolic blank in your magazine cartridge. And then, of course, um, stress and cortisol, if it's too high or too low, that's going to affect thyroid activation, thyroid conversion. You, well, if we don't have enough cortisol, we're not going to be able to activate thyroid hormone. If we have too much cortisol, we're going to shunt it down or thyroid hormone down to T3. And then, of course, gut issues, poor diet, all the inflammation stuff. We need certain nutrients to run those enzymes to activate and convert thyroid hormone. All right, I got a couple of questions here. Let's dig in. Dylan writes in, what do you think of binders, activated charcoal, bentonite clay, zeolite for cleansing the gut? Do they help break down biofilms since they attract metals and toxins? Uh, I like, I like using activated charcoal. I think that's great. I take it typically my patients three hours after, one hour before a meal. That way they're not hitting any herbs and they're not hitting any of the food. That way they're going in there and they're kind of cleaning up what's left over. I like that. I think... Um, Activated charcoal and bentonite clay are adsorbents. Adsorbents mean they attract the toxins like a, a magnet would attract iron filing. So it's not quite like a sponge, like a fiber is kind of like a sponge. It kind of soaks it up. It absorbs with a B. Activated charcoal and bentonite clay adsorb with a D, kind of act like a magnet. I like it. I think it's great. I'm not sure about activated charcoal in killing biofilms, but that's why in my program, we always add in ginger tea. Gingers are very powerful biofilm buster. So is silver. Hope that helps there, Dylan. Hey, Matt, I've realized that I'm classified as an HSP, highly sensitive person, have for a long person, have for a long time. Just wonder what your thoughts are. I notice seemingly small things stress. Well, I mean, I think if you're more sensitive, you really have to make sure that you have a good foundation in your diet and your lifestyle and how you handle stress. So sleep's got to be dialed in. Nutrition's got to be dialed in. Some type of stress-reducing activity during the day, whether it's meditation or prayer or movement, just some kind of routine in there to keep the, the stress under control. And I think it's good to have some kind of a biofeedback device going, whether it's an M-Wave or an aura ring or some kind of HRV, just to kind of give you some feedback that your nervous system is doing well. And then I always like keeping something like, um, you know, magnesium or, you know, a liposomal GABA or some kind of a adaptogenic herb nearby. That way, if you get stressed at all, you can grab that. A lot of people will tend to go grab the sugar or go to drugs or go to stimulants. So if we can have constructive vehicles to deal with stress, that's much better than the destructive vehicles. Um, that conventional medicine will, will offer or even just natural life offers with a lot of the sugar and, and the crap. Tim writes in, what's the best protocol to help with food poisoning? Uh, usually when you find out, you usually don't find out until you start puking, feeling nauseous. Do you take black charcoal at that time? Great question. I got food poisoning last week. I had a green drink and I just had massive, massive diarrhea. Now I solved it in like 30 minutes though. Because at first I didn't know it was a food poisoning thing. I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, I had a lot of MCT oil in my coffee. Maybe I just had a loose stool, right? And then after it happened again, I'm like, oop, something's up. Took three or four activated charcoal. I took my GI Clear 5 and 4 together, which is oil of oregano, a lot of berberines. And I took probiotics with it at the same time. Probiotics. Probiotics help with the inflammation. They can 
push out and kind of, you know, sequester out a lot of the food um, board illnesses. Like if it's an E. coli issue, it can kind of crowd that out. It's also a nice anti-inflammatory. The activated charcoal kind of soaks up a lot of the toxins. It gives some bulk back to the stool as well in case something's irritating the gut. And then the herbs. And I did that. And then within 30 minutes, my stools were solid again. No problem. But it was bad for 30 minutes. If I didn't have that, who knows how long it would have kept on going. I could have kept on going for a couple of days. I mean, not good. But I was able to solve it. Activated charcoal. And then in my line, I could have probably been fine with just GI Clear 5, the emulsified oil of oregano with the probiotics and with the activated charcoal. That probably could have been enough. But I added in the four, which had the berberines in it, which is the golden seal, the barberry grapefruit seed extract, some olive leaf or olive leaf, uh, black walnut, et cetera. So that ended up working out great. That's kind of my protocol that I would use for food poisoning. And anytime I go to Mexico, that's what I bring HCL or well, so digestive support, of course. But if I have a food issue, probiotics, activated charcoal, GI clear four, GI clear five, all at the same time, nonstop throughout the day. I hope that helps there, Tim. Are there bad bugs that I should try to take down with oil of oregano or olive leaf? Hold on, where did it go? Mm, 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 mm. Are there bad bugs I should take down with oil of oregano or olive leaf? Aged garlic, what would be your recommended? Yeah, so just the things I mentioned above, right? My GX are four and five for that would be great. Those are the herbs I mentioned. Um, sodium borate, borax, clean black mold poisoning. Um, regarding black mold, if you have black mold, there's a, a product called corncrobium. It's a pretty good mold. Um, kind of like a, it encapsulates the mold and kills it. That's a pretty good product, corn crobium. Nasser writes in, <clears throat> want to know more about adrenal fatigue, tiredness, even with low-carb diets. Uh, again, some people do really well on a lower-carb kind of ketogenic paleo template because they're coming from a blood sugar roller coaster diet that is driving insulin resistance, that's driving hypersecretions of insulin. And it's causing them to be on this blood sugar roller coaster all day. So some do really well moving in that direction. And again, if you move in that direction, give it a few weeks because it can take a couple of weeks to a month for your metabolism to adapt to a good ketogenic diet. So give that a little bit of time. And then if you're hitting the wall with that, you can always nudge up the carbs daily or weekly until you feel like you're in a better place. Can inflammation cause blood viscosity to increase? How so? Uh, definitely can uh, via agglutination, right? Inflammation causes cells to stick together, right? Platelet aggregation um, causes all the cells to stick together, right? The more anti-inflammatory you are, the more the cells are moving or slippery and they don't clot and um, decrease blood flow. So yeah, for sure. Man, I got so many questions. I can't even keep track of them here. Yes. Noah writes in, Dr. J, you recommended carbs or starches mainly at night. But if I work out at noon, is it okay to have carbs or starches at lunch after workout too? I would say, yeah. I would say, you know, my exception for carbs earlier in the day tends to be if it's post-workout, so I would agree. What causes excess vitamin D-144 when not getting much sunlight or supplementing it? Is that a 25-hydroxy vitamin D? It'd be pretty hard to get 144 unless you're getting it in some other form that you're not aware of. I would say it's probably getting in there some other way. Oscar writes in, I want to know if you know C60 carbon 60 is a new product that is elaborated in olive oil, seems to help mitochondria. I think you mean a C6 carbon, not C60 carbon, but maybe that's the product name. So like a C6 carbon, that's um, that's a hexanoic acid. That's like, I think D Dave Asprey has one called brain octane. It's similar to that. So it's supposedly a ketone that's going to help the brain more. Um, so that's kind of the big benefit of that. Charlie writes in, wouldn't the charcoal wipe out the supplements if you take them at the same time? I mean, to a certain degree, the only exception is if you're doing it for food poisoning purposes, that's why I would do it right away because you really want to basically decrease the inflammation and decrease the um, veracity of the infection. But typically, like I mentioned earlier, three hours after, one hour before. The only exception is if you're taking it because of alcohol purposes or a food purpose or an infection or a food poisoning purpose. Uh, Ramona writes in, I just discovered I have lots of varicose veins in the back of my knees. What do you recommend? Is it reversible? Um, typically, bioflavonoids are really helpful, like uh, OPCs or grapefruit seed extract or resveratrol. Like a lot of those things are, are really good. Uh, horse chestnut for like vein health. 
Um, but outside of that, just getting good movement, getting good movement, whether you have a rebounder or you're just lifting weights and moving and just keeping inflammation down, all that's important. If you have a whole body vibration plate, that's great. If not, um, you know, one of those rebounders that you can get at Walmart, like a trampoline kind of thing is great. Just moving, just moving is excellent. And then just having good antioxidants and good inflammation. And of course, good collagen, right? Those veins are made out of connective tissue. So good collagen peptides are always going to be helpful for vein health. Um, let's see here. Noah writes in, anyone is already dealing with some inflammation in the body due to the guts, would you avoid using a TENS unit for injury? No, I mean, I'm a big fan of bioelectric devices to help with inflammation. TENS is kind of more like an, an electric aspirin. It blocks the pain and inflammation. There are other um, things out there. I, I have a couple of devices called the ARPWAVE that are really good, that work good. Um, Garrett Saltpeter has a device that's out in the market called the newbie and that's we're going to have them on the podcast to talk more about that technology but that's a great technology dr j ever since i started if i've experienced ovarian cyst any suggestion how i can balance my hormones so just curious how do you know that if caused ovarian cyst because typically if for intermittent fasting for short is going to help with insulin sensitivity it's going to help with insulin resistance, essentially make you more sensitive to insulin and high amounts of insulin tend to drive ovarian cysts. So did you get a ultrasound before, did the IF and then retest and saw cyst? Or did you do the IF and then test it afterwards? Because I would guess they were probably already there to begin with. It'd be pretty unlikely that IF were to cause ovarian cyst. But again, I'm going to need a lot more info to give you more specific feedback there. What's your, recommend on, what's your recommendation on healing an infected cyst um, that has naturally burst? You can do like a curcumin or a turmeric paste. Just Google online like turmeric paste. You can put it over that the cyst and then put a Band-Aid on it. And a lot of times it will just suck out all of the toxins and it will help with the inflammation. Is it okay to do a magnet therapy alongside the herb treatment for SIBO? I don't have any problem with that. No issues, Nora. Uh, Genesis writes in, would wild caught salmon and or grass fed butter be causing high vitamin D? Possible, but I don't think there's enough in there to cause that. I mean, maybe a couple thousand in just that alone, max. I don't think enough to get your vitamin D at that level. Let's see here. I think you wrote earlier about the vitamin D being really high. Something else is going on there. And again, the European levels are a little different. So just be mindful. Like if you're in Canada or Europe, it's like a the metric is. 2.2 lower. So 140 in like Europe or Canada could be like equal to like maybe a 50 or 60. So in the US in the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So it could be that that you're looking at and just maybe confusing the reference ranges. So keep that in the back of your head. Okay, here. Oscar writes in C60. It's 60 carbon soccer ball. Not sure. Dank writes in recommendations for 100% pea protein powder that's not high in metals or toxic metals. Yes, my true pea protein. True pea, go to my site, justinhealth.com slash shop, true pea protein. Uh, we test that one for metals and it's non-GMO pea protein. That's a good one. James writes in, happy Friday, Dr. J. Have you checked out the magic pill on Netflix? All about the ketogenic diet. I cut out almonds. Almond milk seem to be causing histamine release, itchy skin, especially on my hands. Thank you. I will check out the magic pill on Netflix. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Yeah, and that's the thing with keto, right? I um, encountered a couple people at Paleo FX where they're like, well, you know, everyone needs to do better on the ketogenic diet. Everyone should do great. And the problem is if you're not a practitioner, you have your own experience. And if the ketogenic diet like helped you get better, then everyone needs a ketogenic diet. That's the missing piece for everyone. But some people, it may not be the missing piece for. They may have to adjust their macro or micronutrients in a way that may not put them at a carbohydrate level that that's, you know, below 50 or below 30 that essentially keeps them in that ketogenic range, so to speak. So I'm all about customizing. And one of the big pitfalls I'd say of the ketogenic diet is if you're relying on that extra fat from nuts or from dairy, there could be sensitivities there. And again, Rob Wolf talked about this in his book, Wired to Eat, is the immunogenic qualities of certain foods, meaning if if you have your immune system is being stimulated by the nuts or by the dairy, that can create a stress response and the stress response can increase blood sugar because cortisol is a glucocorticosteroid and will increase blood sugar mobilization. So you can actually jack up your blood sugar through a stress response of food. And that's kind of a missing variable that I think a lot of people 
may miss out on because they're just looking at the carb content of the food and they're forgetting the immunogenic qualities of the food. Hope that helps. Um, let me keep on rolling here, guys. The questions are just coming in too fast. Um, while doing a parasite cleanse, is it okay to blend one banana with my daily green smoothie? Or does the banana have too much sugar? If you're doing a parasite cleanse, it may be good because a little bit of extra carbs may help bait some of those critters out, kind of like cheese on a mouse trap. So I think that's okay. As long as it's not causing too many issues like bloating and gas. Tiffany writes in, good morning, Dr. J. Thoughts on probiotic enemas, a 12 strain with more bifidos. I find it has helped me and was wondering about your sacro via backdoor. Bad idea. Um, so you're talking about saccharomyces via enema. My thing is this. I always want to take them orally. It's just easier, right? It's not necessarily the big pain in the butt, pun intended there. But um, I would just see... I would just, I try to always do things the easiest way possible for the highest level of compliance. So I would try to all do it, you know, through the mouth orally to see what we can do there. And I'd only go to an enema or a fecal transplant, like worst case scenario. I've seen people get really sick on fecal transplants. Now, again, you're talking more about a probiotic enema. I would say if that's the absolute, you know, situation you have to go to and taking it orally is not helping. I don't have a ton of experience doing them from in the back door, so to speak. So I would always try to do them orally and see how you do first. Oscar writes in, do you use bioresonance machinery to treat patients? I do not. By bioresonance, do you mean something like a Rife machine? Is ribeye the best steak for the highest fat in it? I think ribeye is great. I mean, that or like the bottom roast or the bottom cap I think is great. But yeah, ribeyes are my fave. Mike writes in, will your thyroid support supplements be enough for me to get off my thyroid med completely or do I need to be careful? Well, it depends on what your pattern is. Again, depending on what kind of thyroid pattern you have and then whether or not your adrenals are involved or whether or not your gut's involved, it's kind of a loaded question because there's a lot of areas. I help people with their thyroid sometimes, meaning I help them with their thyroid symptoms sometimes without even touching their thyroid because if we can fix their gut, fix their digestion, fix their adrenals and then support the, the nutrients, sometimes the thyroid can come back online. Others have an autoimmunity where their thyroid gland is, is just living on a prayer because it's been beaten up by the immune system for decades. So everyone's a little different. So I would say yes and no, depending on what your pattern is. And of course, there's an assumption that you're making good diet and lifestyle choices too. Uh, okay. Yeah. I would have to see the lab genesis. Something doesn't make sense with that vitamin D being that high. Uh, how often do you fast a week? I may do like an, I, I always try to do a 12 by 12, you know, which is like a 12 hour fast, 12 hour E period. And then I'll do like an intermittent fast, like once to twice a week. I try to always do like a bulletproof kind of coffee, butter, MCT. I don't like not eating anything. I like having that, that good fat and that collagen in the morning. Some would say that's not a fast. Others would say, well, it's still kind of a protein sparing fast. So it depends on what you're consider. Any suggestions for BP regulation? Normal in the AM, but seems to increase at night. Hard to say. I mean, it could be just stress from the day. I would just look at um, getting into a good parasympathetic state, maybe add some magnesium and see how it goes. Uh, how much should I cook my greens to lower oxalates? How much would a slight elevation in arabinose in organic acids raise oxalates? Again, if your arabinose is elevated, it tells me that's a yeast overgrowth. So I would work on getting the yeast out, cleaning out your gut. And then number two, I'd only worry about ox oxalates if you're really having a reaction to them, whether it's a pain issue or a sensitivity issue. I wouldn't try cutting them out. You can just steam your food or saute your food. That'll cut about 30 to 50% of the oxalates down. So I wouldn't worry about oxalates unless you're having a kidney stone issue or you're really having muscle pain issue or you're really sensitive to it and going low oxalate helps. Again, steaming or sauteing your food won't be enough to like make a high oxalate food low, but maybe make a high oxalate food medium and maybe make a medium one low. So just only go that road, only go that road if you really need to, because there's a lot of good foods that are high in oxalates like spinach. Um, do you eat awful? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Oscar writes in, I'm trying to improve my microbiome. Do you think Shilajit and clays have soil probiotics. Soil probiotics seem to be the next step to improvement in the probiotic industry. Yeah, I mean, I like Megaspore. That's more of a spore-based. Um, from a soil base, there's Prescript Assist. They changed the formula recently, but those are some good um, options to help improve your gut health, you know, once you know your gut's clean. Addy writes in, what's the best time to take probiotics? Depends. I like in the morning or at night, first thing on an empty stomach, I think is great. There could be some benefit to take it with food. 
So, but morning and night, I think is a great time. You welcome Nora. I hope that helps. And then can you give some advice for central sleep apnea? Darren Schmidt says that ARN is the key. What's your take? What does ARN stand for? Oscar, let me know. Any difference between um, VS frozen veggies and fruits? What does VS stand for? VS frozen veggies and fruits. Let me know. Your mitosynergy is phenomenal. Even at one dose, I feel an increase in energy. Any other mitochondrial support that you could recommend? PQQ or berberines? Yeah, PQQ is great. Thanks for your feedback, James. PQQ is excellent. I like that. Um, and then depending on what you need, some people can even go for extra CoQ10 or carnitine. It just totally um, depends. Okay, so fresh versus frozen veggies. Uh, ideally, if you're fresh, are going to be within a day or two for sure. The problem is a lot of people are eating their veggies like – or they're getting them a day or two before they're about to wilt, so to speak. So I would go with frozen if you know you're not going to eat them fast. I think having some frozen ones, I always have like a bag of frozen broccoli or kale or, you know, peas or carrots, something simple that's there because sometimes the veggies turn. So if you can eat your veggies faster and they're not going to wilt and you know they haven't been at the shelf, you know, four days already at the store, then I think it's okay. Um, sorry, RNA, ribonucleic acid. Uh, it depends. I mean, RNA, I mean, that's a standard process product that Darren's talking about. I find that sleep apnea, there's a couple ways. Number one, you can have your, your mouth evaluated to make sure that there's not anything going on with the jaw or with your tongue, those kind of things. Again, I would see that being a long-term issue. You would notice that would, would be a problem probably for a long period of time. I find people have sleep apnea as they get older, and that's because inflammation accumulates as they get older. Oxidative stress accumulates. I find getting inflammation in the body improved makes a huge difference on sleep apnea. The tongue, the jaw is less inflamed. The airways are more dilated or opened. Body's more resilient. I mean, one thing that you can do is just do some mouth taping, and then that way you're breathing through the nose. I find that like if I'm sleeping on my back and I get a little too much saliva kind of um, congealing in my throat and I breathe through the mouth, sometimes that can block the throat a tiny bit. So you could always do some mouth taping to help with that. That way it's forcing it through your nose and there won't be necessarily a, any blockage from any saliva hanging in the back of your mouth and then the air coming in. Uh, do you eat liver or organ meat often? Okay, so that's the Ophil you mean. Um, I don't eat it too often, but I mean, if I do eat it, I'm going to get it from like a Epic bar or I'm going to get like, uh, if I go out, I'll do like some liver, some foie gras at a nice restaurant. So that's kind of where I'll, I'll typically get that either an Epic bar or uh, some foie gras, uh, us wellness meats has some really good liver too. So that works pretty good. Is putting ice on an injury. Not a good idea after because you want the inflammation and the blood flow in the area acutely for healing. That's a great question. Um, that's a really, really good question. We definitely don't want heat. We don't want to accelerate the inflammation. But, you know, there's some – I've read a couple of, you know, blog posts on this where they talk about, you know, 20 minutes on, three hours off is kind of the conventional thinking. And, of course, anytime there's a conventional thinking about something, I, I always tend to want to go the opposite. Uh, I'm okay with it acutely. But I think if you have an injury like that, you really want to make sure the soft tissue gets worked on and you want to make sure that you're you're giving a lot of good anti-inflammatory support because the problem is the inflammation response kind of gets out of control and then that can prevent healing from happening in the long run. So you want to get the inflammation down later on. But in the beginning, the inflammation actually helps vasodilate so you can get a lot of immune response there. But down the road, you want to work on getting that better. I would say... I'm on the fence. I would still probably ice, but um, I would really work on getting the underlying soft tissue fixed, and I'd work on treating the inflammation inside out, not just topically with ice, but with fish oil, with curcumin, with boswellia, with um, with um, healing collagen peptides too. Was your green drink poisoning from a store uh, or bought fresh made from home? It was from a store. It was from the store and it was like a, it's a good brand too. And I've, I've had it in the last two days in a row and I had no problem. So it may have just been one isolated incident. Hard to say. And then, um, any way to pick green powder drinks that will not bloat any ingredients stay away from depends. If you're really sensitive to FODMAPs, then you may have to be really careful and, and try to do lower FODMAP green vegetables, which may be really hard. I would say get the SIBO fixed, get all that dialed in and you'll probably be good to go first. 
can you take multiple types of magnesium at the same time, like citrate, which helps with constipation, but also want to take L-theanate, which crosses the blood brain? I have no problem with that. I mean, you can do some like natural calm for the bowels and you can do like some magnesium gel or threonate for brain or free relaxation. I have no problem with that. All right, guys, I got to jump on a patient call here. Phenomenal chatting. I'll be back on Monday. Again, make sure you sign up for that Thyroid Reset Summit, thyroidresetsummit.com. Click on the link below. It's going to be great. Lots of good interviews that I'm doing as we speak. Phenomenal chatting, guys. You have a phenomenal day. We'll talk soon. Take care.